Okay, let's just get started. Uh, first, I want to welcome Purushottamakshetra Prabhu, uh, who's identifying himself as Chris McNay, uh, but that's okay. Uh, speaking to us from just down the road from Gita Nagari, uh, just moved recently from Southern California, and over some time, I don't know how much time, has done considerable research on the subject of milk and what is called DHA for short, which seems to be uh, the, the chemical uh, that would be identified as that which is um, nourishing the finer tissues of the brain, as Srila Prabhupada would, would say. Oh, Vladimir Koshalev says, please identify me as translator. So yeah, uh, I don't know what that means to identify something more than just announcing. Um, Oh, Darya Chandrika, is there something we need to do? Yes, I put, I put Vladimir instead of Prim Rasa as a translator. Is that okay? okay. Yes. Okay. And then Prim Rasa can hear from him. Um, yeah, maybe Purushottam Prabhu, you want to just go ahead and give a little history of how you came into this subject. If you want to say something about your own background, um, I don't know, uh, sure. professional background, whatever. Okay. Well, first of all, thank you for uh, inviting me to speak with uh, all the Prabhus, assembled Prabhus here. Um, as to my background, uh, I should say, first of all, that uh, I practically have no uh, background in uh, taking care of cows at all uh, in terms of the practical aspect of it. Um, I uh, only recently moved here to uh, Itanagri and every day uh, sitting in my office, I can look out at our Govardhan Hill, but that's the extent of my direct cow uh, experience. Mm -hmm. uh, I uh, uh, have always been interested in science uh, starting many, many years ago, as a, practically as a child. Um, I studied uh, psychology in college and then uh, immediately went to work for uh, the second largest school district in Los Angeles with uh, 700,000 students uh, working as a carpenter, which is what I uh, had done during my uh, college years to make ends meet. And then gradually I was promoted and promoted and promoted because I had a college degree and wasn't lazy or crazy. So um, the last few years of my, before I retired from uh, the school district, I uh, worked in a department that I ended up after the, what, the recession of 2008, I ended up there uh, as a default position. They, they had a, a, a slot open uh, that was funded, unlike many, many positions at the district at that point. So I was sitting in an, in an office uh, with a boss who uh, was somewhat of a workaholic. And he didn't know me and he didn't know what I could or couldn't do. So he rarely gave me an assignment. So this was starting in 2014. So I had a, a private office and a fast internet connection and nothing to do. 
<laughs> and getting paid for it. That's pretty and, good. And getting paid handsomely, in <laughs> fact, for this position. <laughs> it was a remarkable situation. So I don't ordinarily read uh, um, popular scientific articles and magazines and so on, but somehow or other, I came across uh, one particular article that I'm thinking to myself as I read this, gosh, this really strongly reminds me of Prabhupada's comments about uh, finer tissues of the brain. So I followed it up after reading the, this uh, popular presentation. I followed it up by reading the uh, original publication from the, the, the researchers themselves. And immediately I started, I realized, yeah, there, there's something that they're saying here that's very important. So I, I started asking myself questions. And uh, in the course of asking these questions, I learned more and more of it that convinced me, even though uh, obviously I've done no personal research on the subject, that uh, this DHA that you mentioned in the introduction uh, is one key to what Prabhupada was talking about when he's saying that milk nourishes the finer tissues of the brain. So this uh, experience of being paid to look into this went literally went on for years. Uh, I, I uh, over the course of my remaining employment with the district, I uh, uh, spent anywhere from six to seven and a half hours a day looking into this subject and asking myself questions and seeing if I could find answers that were relevant to understanding what Prabhupada said in our understanding of scripture. And so during the course of that time, uh, as I began to recognize there's really something here, I not only did the work, but I collected the, the documents, the videos, the photographs, the the uh, scientific studies in full. So in other words, it's not just that I have some kind of a reference. I literally have the, the complete documents, electronic files that are all searchable. So if I need to go back or if someone needs to look into this repository of documents, they can search and find, uh, you know, based on keywords information that's located there. So at this point, I have more than 12,000 documents, <laughs> about, about 350 gigabytes of material. Uh, so, can I just ask a detail? Uh, does this mean because you were sitting in an office of uh, your school district, did that in particular give you access uh, to databases of, uh, you know, un university, like a university um, library access of digital academic journals? Sure, I understand your question and the answer is no. However, as a graduate of UCLA, I do have that type of access. Oh, okay. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, there was, I had good access to whatever I was looking for. On occasion, as I'm sure you well know, uh, even all, even all uh, academic uh, journals, the, the colleges do pay for them. And so if the college is not paying for a particular journal, you can get the, the abstract, but you can't get the, the full uh, document itself. However, uh, it's uncommon that you can't find it somewhere. In other <laughs> words, uh, for example, the author may have chosen to publish his uh, draft version as opposed to the, uh, the final published version that came out in some uh, 
publication. Mm -hmm. But in any case, you had access through your um, University of California uh, scholar scholarship. Yeah, as an alumnus, yeah. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. So 12,000 documents, that's a, that's a pretty good number. <laughs> Which means also uh, you can trace the course of the research over time. Um, yes. How, how uh, the research develops over time. That's true. Yeah. It, sometimes that's a useful approach to uh, you know, looking into my own um, developing awareness of this this issue, and then also you know going back to uh, the way I kind of sometimes remember things is is you know by time. So I can I can think, oh, you know, that was such and such a period of time, and then I can go to those dates and then look for what I was looking at at that period in my right. in my work. Mm -hmm. I have a, uh, I, I use a, a PC, uh, apologies to all the Apple users out there. Uh, <laughs> I, I use a PC and I use a program that's called X1 Search, which is quite remarkable. Uh, it indexes uh, all the metadata and uh, all the words in every document that I tell it to. So, uh, mm -hmm. you know, my Cal protection folder with all these documents in it is completely indexed. So mm. uh, I can, I can slice and dice that, that database, so to speak, just about any way you can imagine to look for things and look for connections between things. Mm. Interesting. So, um, You've prepared uh, quite a long um, PowerPoint slideshow, which we wouldn't have time to see everything of, but do you want to show us a few of those slides? Sure. Um, let's see. What I've done is I pared it down to, I don't know, 10 slides or so. And it's, it's specifically focused on the just a, a minuscule selection of the quotes and documents that that I've found over the years relevant to this right. issue. Uh, it nowhere near covers the, the gamut, nor does what I'm gonna uh, share today uh, address the follow-on issues that I think are are really, you know, okay, so uh, we found some scientific backing for Prabhupada's position. And that's, you know, that's nice, that's important. However, it's what comes out of that that I think is much more important. And it takes uh, uh, significantly more time to present that follow on logic than just the material itself. So I think what I'm gonna to do to start, and then we'll see if we get questions that take us further, is just to talk a little bit about the, the, the scientific stuff. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'm no expert at this sort of thing, um, but I see here, it shows there's a, there's a thing that says, share my screen. So does that mean that people are going to be able to see what's on the screen, on my screen? Yeah, you, you click share screen and, yeah. then, uh, and then you can choose. You should be able to see that there are different, uh, whatever you have open, yeah. you can choose from. So if you have PowerPoint open, yeah, select that and say whatever. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Okay, that's showing your whole screen. Okay, so, all right, so let's see if I can narrow that down.
there. So can you see this first slide? That yes, that's good. The screen that starts with what is the unique quality? That's it, we got it. Okay, very good. Glad that worked out. <laughs> so uh, what is the unique quality found in the milk of properly cared for cows that is essential for developing the finer tissues of the human brain? and yet is not commonly available in a civilized human diet. Let's examine the facts. The cerebral cortex, working in concert with, other, with multiple other regions of the brain is widely considered the seat of higher level cognitive activity. So naturally, if uh, we wanna find uh, what it is about the, fi the finer tissues of the brain that's gonna help us have the intelligence to understand, uh, you know, scripture, Srila Prabhupada's instructions. It's most likely going to be processed in the cerebral cortex where uh, we evaluate, synthesize, analyze, apply, and comprehend knowledge. So, there is this substance uh, called DHA or docosahexaenoic acid. It's <laughs> a type of fat or lipid. And uh, it's one of the, you, it's become somewhat popular to talk about omega threes uh, as a dietary supplement. And it's in one of these omega threes. It's an unsaturated, uh, fatty acid uh, are known as a PUFA or PUFA. And uh, so here's a quote from uh, uh, one uh, researcher, Tanaka, uh, he published in 2012. He said, DHA is a crucial component of neural membranes and is present in 30 to 40% of the gray matter of the cerebral cortex. That's an extraordinary statement, just in and of itself, that this one fat is 30 to 40% of the gray matter of the cerebral cortex, which we remember is where we process information. So this next fellow, McCann in 2005 said, Within the context of specific experimental designs, changes in uh, brain concentrations of DHA are positively associated with changes in cognitive or behavioral performance. So here's someone that's connecting this DHA, which is found in the cerebral cortex with cognitive and behavioral performance which of course is what, again, we're talking about when the Prabhupada talks about nourishing the finer tissues of the brain to have the intelligence to understand what he's talking about. So now here's this quote that I originally read that I told you about earlier in the popular journal. We have shown that dietary DHA is crucial for large scale brain organization. Now, uh, there's a photograph here of a macaque monkey with someone's glasses we all <laughs> may recognize. <laughs> this behavior. Oh, yes. <laughs> <laughs> no doubt. Anyone who's been in Vrindavan and who was a victim of <laughs> one of these monkeys with their glasses knows all about this. <laughs> <laughs> right. So now here's the, the, the story behind the quote. Um, this uh, DHA was, was first specifically identified as an important component of the brain in the 50s. And uh, by uh, 2000 or so, researchers 
and had come to realize that maybe there's something very important about this stuff because it's composed uh, so much of the cerebral cortex of the brain. And uh, so they started what they understood was going to be a long-term uh, experiment. They took uh, 21 of these macaque monkeys and divided them into three groups uh, and gave them a, a, a comfortable home, each group, a, a nice place to stay and food to eat and things to do. Uh, the only difference between the three groups was that one group was fed a normal, healthy macaque monkey diet. One group, they uh, fed the same diet, but they eliminated any of the uh, dietary uh, products that would have uh, DHA in them. So they, these monkeys were not getting any DHA. And the third group, they uh, supplemented the standard macaque monkey diet with extra DHA. And then uh, roughly 15, 16 years later, one of the things that they did as part of their uh, experimental protocol uh, is they uh, recognized that at that point, um, MRI scans of the brain were becoming, uh, you know, something that were practical and, and understood and that people could, uh, you know, for example, put a monkey in an MRI machine. So uh, there's a specific type of MRI that's called a, a functional fMRI or fMRI uh, that makes it possible to witness real time, kind of like a video of the activity in a brain. So let's say, for example, you know, the monkey is in the MRI and they give him uh, a task. They can witness what portions of his brain or her brain lights up as they perform the task sitting in the MRI. So uh, they uh, proceeded to provide these monkeys with various, shall we say, intellectual tasks and other sorts of tasks as well. And they noticed that uh, the prefrontal cortex of the, their brains would light up when they were given these intellectual tasks. They also noticed that there was a strong uh, interconnection. The, the uh, neurons that go from various portions of the brain would light up as well, uh, for example, uh, from the prefrontal cortex to the hippocampus where uh, uh, some memory is processed. And uh, so they're uh, like, wow, this is pretty amazing that you know, we can see by giving these monkeys these activities, um, you know, what, what's going on in their brain. So then, you know, of course, they're looking at the three groups, the no DHA, the standard diet, and uh, uh, supplemented with extra DHA. And lo and behold, the monkeys that uh, had no DHA, their cerebral cortex was uh, quite significantly less active and the interconnections between the other portions of the brain were far less active than at the other end of the scale where the monkeys that were given the uh, extra DHA, uh, they were lighting up 
strongly in this prefrontal cortex and the connections were very strong to other portions of the brain. So here they had uh, pretty strong evidence that there's something going on with this DHA in terms of intellectual activity. Uh, so then the other thing that they looked at is that this fMRI uh, allows them to measure the um, literal size of various structures within the brain. So they, of course, measured the size of the structures that they're looking at, and they found that the uh, DHA deficient monkeys uh, their prefrontal cortex was significantly smaller than that of the uh, monkeys that were fed the extra DHA for all this time. So this was like, I'm thinking, wow, all right, where does all this, what's, what's this DHA about? You know, where does it come from? Uh, where do we get it? And so, first of all, uh, right here in the quote, dietary DHA. So, it, as it turns out, um, DHA is practically not uh, something that the human body can produce. You have to take it in your diet. Similarly, with, with monkeys and other animals you have to take the DHA in your diet. So where does it come from? Um, it says here, adequate DHA can only be provided by what you eat. It is found primarily in wild salmon and other fatty ocean predator fish whose prey in turn consume phytoplankton and micro and macro algae. So you have these large fish eating smaller fish who are eating phytoplankton, algae. Uh, so DHA is also found in marine krill and certain mushrooms. These are the common dietary sources of DHA. They are readily available for some people, yet consumption of the flesh of these living entities is not recommended by Lord Krishna, nor, unlike cow's milk, are they easily accessible for everyone? So photosynthesis in plants powers the ultimate DHA chemical factory. Photosynthesis takes place most actively in the growing tips of plants. So we have this uh, phytoplankton, micro and macro algae, marine krill and so on. Uh, all of these are, are, are ultimately drawing their DHA from the photosynthesis in the algae that they're uh, finding in the marine environment or that are in the marine environment. So the DHA bond captures the energy of the sun to transduce light energy into electron flow. So the DHA uh, is the um, mechanism whereby the energy of the sun is, is transformed into the energy that runs uh, these microorganisms and uh, the, all the other uh, plants that depend on photosynthesis for uh, getting energy. So, Confined cows whose diet is restricted to a very limited variety of plants and grains grown on artificially fertilized soil, which of course is the industrial dairy standard, have virtually no DHA in their milk. They're, they're not eating fresh grown plants. They're not eating the tips of those plants where the, the photosynthesis is taking place and the DHA is being formed. Uh, so barring artificial supplementation with fish or algae oils, which as we well know, um, is not uncommon in, uh, in some uh, uh, 
industrial uh, dairy feeding protocols. Um, so cows grazing on exceptionally diverse, healthy, young growing forms, grasses, legumes, brassicas, shrubs, and some trees, many of which are inedible by humans, fertilized by their own dung and urine, personally harvest the DHA produced by these plants and pass it directly into their milk and flesh. So the microorganisms uh, in the soil uh, are part of this soil food web, just as the microorganisms in the marine environment are part of the marine food web that I just described earlier, where you have the smallest marine organisms uh, that are eaten by the larger ones and larger ones and so on until you get to where the, that DHA is concentrated in things like uh, wild caught Alaska salmon. So uh, we have a similar food web, uh, uh, terrestrial food web in the soil that also concentrates DHA. Uh, and you have these plants growing in the soil that are depending on photosynthesis to, to get their energy for growth. And so you have the DHA in the growing tips of these plants. And the cows are um, particularly sensitive to the um, wanting to eat this DHA, they'll, they'll, they'll seek out plants that have these strongly growing tips. They, they like it, you know, fresh grasses, you know, young tender grass, which may, that quote may sound a little familiar from uh, reading the Christian book. So um, there's one, uh, there's virtually uh, no scientific research. There's very, very little uh, on uh, this issue of DHA, terrestrial DHA uh, as a source for uh, uh, humans. It's, when, you, when you read about uh, you know, omega-3s from you know, people that are into some sort of uh, health supplementation, they'll, they'll either talk about, uh, you know, as I said, wild caught Alaska salmon or mackerel, or they may take um, algae pills, that sort of thing. Um, but uh, they, they never talk about a terrestrial source. And it, it, it's reasonable because virtually all the terrestrial sources are things that people don't eat, but cows will eat them. So there's uh, this one uh, actually graduate student, uh, Melissa Bainbridge. She gave a presentation in 2017 to the American Dairy Association um, her research focuses on understanding how fatty, milk fatty acid profiles relate to cow care and nutrition status strategies. Uh, she noted that as scientists and the public are becoming more aware of the public health and economic value of nutritionally superior milk from cows grazed on diverse pasture they're willing to pay a very significant premium for this milk, particularly since it has an overall beneficial fatty acid profile that at least is at least double that of milk, most milk produced in the US. In addition, she shared that an analysis An analysis of the fatty acid profile in cow's milk 
provides a quantitative measure of that cow's health, diet, and the status of her digestive system. And significantly, she stated that the most effective of the dietary, of the dairy cow care protocols she evaluated, raising cows on diverse pasture would be the most appreciated by the consumer. So a quote from her, uh, the contents of CLA, uh, which is uh, an, N, uh, uh, an omega-3 fatty acid in a serving of whole milk at three and a quarter percent fat, increased when cows were grazed on pasture as compared to being given pearl millet in a, a, a barn as their diet. So here we have someone who's actually done some specific research looking at cow's diet and uh, the access to uh, DHA. And uh, she's also uh, connected that to how consumers recognize the value of this higher quality milk come, which coming from cows that are grazed on pasture. It's a very important point is even even if uh, we take very nice care of our cows and feed them, you know, luscious silage and so on and so forth, uh, we may not be getting the, uh, the DHA that's requisite for uh, nourishing the finer tissues of the brain. So DHA is found in the tender growing tips of certain plants which thrive in an agro silvo pastoral grazing ground. So here we have a painting of Krishna with the cows in an agro silvo pastoral grazing ground. That's what we're looking at there. The ability of forages to maximize the amount of long chain N3 PUFAs in meat and milk is dependent on the nature of the forage, including the amount and type of lipid present, and is greater when animals consume fresh forage as compared with hay or silage. So this is an interesting point because not only are we talking about, well, this is how Krishna took care of his cows and still does, um, it's, it, it's also significant because the human body has a, uh, a mechanism whereby if uh, there's insufficient DHA in the diet, uh, and given that DHA is composing 30 to 40 percent of the Cerebral cortex, obviously a very important uh, chemical, if, if nothing else, in the brain. Um, the human body has a way of making up for a shortage, and it's not by producing DHA, it's by substituting cholesterol for DHA. So the the downside of that substitution is it makes uh, the, the uh, signal transduction in the brain from, from cell to cell, neuron to neuron, uh, far less efficient. So you get what you might call in layman's terms, fuzzy or dull thinking. So here we have, uh, you know, going back to uh, the macaque monkeys, monkeys with a, a, a no DHA in their, their, their diet for so many years, were dull thinkers. Their brains didn't light up very much in the fMRI machine. So here we have a way of uh, enhancing our thinking simply by um, enhancing our, the, the diet of our cows.
So DHA is most abundant in various forage species at different times. Cows can sense this differential and selectively graze the growing tips of these plants, not only by species, but time of day, growth, stage, season, etc. A grazing ground offering a diverse range of healthy plants will more likely than not have some plants with DHA available during most times of the year. Omega-3 fatty acids can be degraded in the cow's rumen if they are restricted from eating according to their choice of forbs, grasses, legumes, brassicas, shrubs, and some trees. So here's a quote. Grazing, pasture feeding versus indoor and conserved forage and concentrates increases N3 PUFAs or ultimately DHA in cow milk when cows can select leaves which have high N3 PUFA concentrations. Biodiverse grasslands enhance this effect as some forbs show less PUFA rumen bio biohydrogenation than grasses, thus increasing efficiency of PUFA transfer from forage to milk. So the cows ha have the sensitivity to understand, okay, uh, I like this stuff and they may not understand it, but they like it because it has DHA. And so they're going to go out in the field and they're going to pick what they really like to eat, which are the, the plants that have these growing tips. And where, the grow, where do we have in the growing tips? Well, we have the DHA that's produced by the photosynthesis going on in those growing tips. So, uh, uh, a quick question, excuse yes. me. What is a forb? Some oh, forbs show. Uh, it's it's uh, 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 just a type of forage that you would find in a, a, a pasture. So forage. Yes. So here's a situation where, all right, now uh, the, uh, the farmer, the cow herd, becomes responsible for uh, enhancing the, the, the diet of the cows to include DHA. And how can he do that? Well, he needs to enhance the uh, photosynthesis going on in the plants that they're eating. And how can he do that? He can, uh, going back to that uh, soil food web, uh, he can feed that soil food web with the uh, dung and urine from the cows. And uh, that dung and urine will ultimately be tr transformed as the, the fertilizer, the minerals that, that are required to uh, feed the, the plants uh, as they photosynthesize and develop more DHA. So we have to become understand, we have to understand how to take really good care of the soil and how to provide uh, plants on pasture that are, are actively growing for our cows so that they can harvest the DHA to transform that into uh, healthy milk for us to offer to the deities and take for increasing our uh, intelligence. So then we have, uh, you know, requirement for um, not only caring for the cows, but caring for them in a, a thoughtful way, you know, thinking very carefully about what it is cows are eating uh, 
and how to take care of the environment so that, that the cows are, are always having access to a nice pasture. Now, naturally, in some uh, environments, it's going to be more difficult. You know, if you're, if you're uh, living in Hawaii and, you know, you have uh, 365 days a year growing season, that's one thing. If you're living in uh, uh, Siberia, it's going to be very, very challenging to provide cows fresh grown, fresh, fresh pasture year round. But in the, in the temperate portions of the planet, which of course are most of the planet, um, we can uh, work hard to provide this uh, fresh forage for the cows. So that's one of our responsibilities. And then it becomes, you know, uh, uh, a kind of socioeconomic imperative that, all right, um, we need a, a a social system that makes it possible for the farmers to have the time to um, spend studying their uh, their local ecology and carefully adjust as they uh, become intimately aware of the, uh, their uh, environment to give the cows a proper diet. Hmm. So ecologically favorable growing conditions allow a wide range of plants, animals, and microorganisms living symbiotically in the rich soil of an agro silvo pastoral environment to produce a virtually never ending feast of DHA, rich forage in their growing tips. So here's another quote. The forage quality of plants is usually highest during the early period of plant tissue growth. And this period is typically short relative to forage lifetime. Therefore, animals constricted to limited pasture are frequently forced to eat plant material of marginal food quality or must bear the cost of searching for young tissues. So, <clears throat> That's the end of the uh, the uh, slideshow that I had put together, and uh, so. Purushottam Kshetra Prabhuji, Hare Krishna. Um, <clears throat> thank you for uh, presenting this. I mean, <clears throat> we've been working with this topic with the ministry. I think since two thousand and eighteen, maybe. You presented at New Vrindavan Farm Conference at uh, Science and Consciousness and what is that really called? Consciousness and Consciousness in Science in Science Conference exactly. Mm -hmm. And <clears throat> today it was so clear what you presented, how you presented this specific part, and what 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 it rang a bell in me, and I've been talking to many different um, devotees and especially people who are working with agroforestry. In Brazil, now there's a big number of agroforest practitioners, especially because of Ernest Get and the Syntropic Farming Movement. And <clears throat> your findings about a system which allows uh, different kind of herbs and plants and new uh, grasses is very much at the heart of these systems. So much so that Brazilian dairy industry has kind of mimicked that. And they're coming up with monocrops, which is not what we want, but they have lines of trees with grass in the middle. And they get exactly that principle of the early stages of the fodder of a Mombasa grass, of maybe <clears throat> other grasses, but also supplemented with herbs. Yes. Now there's a huge movement on the corridors of trees by the side, there's innumerable herbs, which are very beneficial for the cow. So it's very interesting that we are coming to that conclusion that it's not only about feeding the cows, but what we feed the cows and how we feed the cows. And that grazing idea. Yes, that not need. only how we. Yes, not only how we feed the cows, but how we as devotees have to live our lives to be able to properly 
to care for not only the cows, but what the cows eat and the entire environment so that we have the uh, a balanced ecology that makes it possible for these things to grow so nicely for the cows. Fantastic. And that, I mean, if you extrapolate that, and that we're talking of one important element, which is DHA, and that is the same for all the other nutrients in the food chain, so zinc and molybdenum. So having a farming system which is regenerative, regenerative seems to me to be a very clear focus that we should be targeting at. What do you think about that? Yes, uh, I think I, I agree with you. However, it, it, it's important to recognize that um, this, this word regenerative um, is, is significant. It's uh, reproducing something that we once had on this planet. Yes. It's not that uh, somehow or other we're inventing something. It's we've lost so much in the last 150, 200 years with industrial farming and monoculture uh, farming that we've completely destroyed the soil. We've destroyed the ecology of our farms. And now we're feeding people, uh, you know, uh, empty calories. There's practically nothing there now. And so we need to regenerate. And once we've regenerated, then we can, you know, proceed down a path of, uh, you know, uh, ultimately enlightenment. In other words, we have, we're going to have the intelligence to be able to understand scripture and, you know, get somewhere in our lives. So it, it's all connected. It's not that, you know, uh, uh, this, it, oh, it's very nice, you know, Prabhupada likes cows and it's going to nourish our brain and so on. You know, it's, we have to live in a, in a, in a, in a system uh, where the, everyone works together to be able to create uh, the proper environment for this kind of healthy growth. I'd like to also just say one more comment. <clears throat> you remember this, maybe Krishna Kshetra Swami was also with us, or maybe it was the previous visit to Sam. Sam is an Amish friend that we have in common, and he is an incredible person. We, as a ministry, had visited him officially, and before that, we did a visit also. And Sam said something quite striking to me, at least at the time. And what he said, I asked him, how much milk do you produce? And he says, I'm not going to laugh at you because you're a nice person. <laughs> but actually, <laughs> I'm going to laugh at you. <laughs> but actually, I don't care. What I do is I take care of my second herd. And by yeah. second herd, he meant his microbiological herd, all the microbes under the soil. He said, that's where my wealth is. And with right. that wealth, I don't have to worry about milk. It just comes in abundance. Remember that? Absolutely. Sam's a smart guy. <laughs> So I see we have a hand up. Yeah, um, before we go to Prabhu Das Prabhu, I'd like to um, comment, maybe ask. Uh, one thing that this brings up to me is that it undercuts, maybe it's obvious, but it, it undercuts the argument uh, of devotees that it's it's quite okay to uh, take uh, commercially produced milk from factory dairies uh, because that is nourishing the finer tissues of the brain. And from what you've uh, pointed out is that's not going to be the case because what are those cows being fed? There's not going to be the DHA. Um, and so that completely undercuts the, the purpose. Devotees will say, oh, 
I have to drink milk. Prabhupada said, you have to drink milk. So I'm drinking milk. I'm buying milk from the shop. Uh, Prabhupada said, drink milk because you need it for your brain. So it seems like this is saying, uh, sorry, that milk is not going to help you. It's not going to nourish your brain. Yeah. I think it's important to recognize that what you say is 100% accurate. However, you have to add on to that in addition that uh, um, there should be the mentality that this is the direction we're going in, even if we're not there. So getting back to that word regenerative, okay, yeah. we have, we have uh, uh, an environment that needs to be regenerated. Uh, we have a mentality that needs to be regenerated. And if we can understand that, okay, we should take milk, that's a good start. And now let's understand how to take, how to create, how to make it possible to take high quality milk full of DHA that's going to then give mm -hmm. us this uh, nourishment yeah. of our, our brain. Now, um, I, I, I want to go ahead uh, and let Prabhu Das Prabhu uh, comment or ask question, but just to mention, I have, I have some comments here from Ra Radharanya Prabhu, uh, who is trained as a medical doctor. He's in Ger Germany, mm. and he did extensive uh, research also and he wrote a book uh, on nutrition, a medical book, uh, in which he quotes from not 12,000, but from 1,400 studies. Um, and he is not actively practicing as a medical practitioner officially, um, but he has a business of um, um, supplements, mm. food supplements, including uh, an, an oil, uh, I think it's called Toco Protect, uh, which includes uh, DHA, but it's taken from algae. Yes, And he argues that um, there are several disadvantages of taking too much milk. Most people, most devotees, says take too much milk, and it's very detrimental, and it's a major problem, he said, in India. So better, if I understand his argument, better to just take this DHA from algae. But I think what you're saying in your um, other uh, parts of your slideshow, which you haven't shown, is that that is not uh, sustainable. It's not sustainable to, to say now the world should just go harvest algae for DHA. It's not going to be, that's not sustainable. Is that right? It's, it, I, I, it depends on the source. Um, the specific to taking a supplement that's sourcing DHA from algae, the issue there more than anything is the vast majority of the world's population simply do not have and never will have access to these supplements. It's, mm. if nothing else, it's uh, financially beyond their means. Now, it may be that uh, there, there are certain uh, uh, algae strains that are, are uh, certainly more um, uh, conducive to producing this DHA in the first place, but uh, um, most people are not gonna, as part of their, uh, their diet, gonna be taking algae from a pond or algae in a, a 
uh, factory produced uh, supplement oil of some sort. Uh, the thing that the, the main point that I'm making is um, taking DHA from uh, properly cared for cows is something that's going to be accessible to anyone anywhere in the temperate regions of the planet, which is pretty much everyone. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, and what you said, it actually it, it is, is correct. Uh, it's just that you need to look at, well, what, what specific source are we talking about? Mm. Okay. Um, yeah, that's a bigger discussion. Yeah. Let's go to Prabhudas Prabhu. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you very much, Prabhu, for your presentation. Prabhudas is in Italy, north, north, uh, northwest Italy. Yes, and uh, we actually have in our community two barns. One is on the mountain, and uh, he the cows can eat for at least six to eight months the grass from the pasture. So, and the other barn he, he just converted in the last few months. It, it, it mo they mostly eat forage. So I, I have a few questions. If the milk, sorry, I have my English, I try my best to explain. If the milk is uh, uh, produced, if the cows produce milk from, from forage, normal forage, but they are protected, the, the calves are not killed and they are not going to be killed. So, that makes the difference in the psychology of the cows and, and, the, and also in the, in the quality of the milk. So this is the first question. Because, for example, some uh, farmers, they can, uh, the, the cows, they can eat grass freely and very nice grass, but then they kill the calves. So what's the difference if you have made researches on this? Okay. And uh, my question is from your presentation, it looks that if the cows, they eat only forage, there is nothing in, in that milk. Is correct what I understood or perhaps there are some other nutrients which are useful for the humans, for us. And if some DHA, at least in a, a small quantity is still there. Yeah, certainly there's, uh, there's, there's other nutrients in uh, whatever diet a cow eats. So it's, it's not that there's no nutrients. It's, we were specifically focused on the DHA. So that's going to depend also, of course, on their diet. And I explained what it is that's required to give them a diet that's going to be rich in DHA. Um, of course, for every uh, specific environment, there'll be different types of, of plants that are appropriate at, at the time of day, time of season, and so on. So it's not that, no, uh, you have to feed the cows um, according to this, I'll call it the DHA diet, uh, for them to have a healthy, you know, nutrient-rich diet. It's just that to get the DHA, they're going to need to have this diet that includes the, the fresh growing tips of plants. Otherwise, um, there, otherwise there is no DHA at all. What, uh, what is it your... may not be that there's none. It may not be that there's none. It's just that there's little in comparison. Ah. Please give me a little hope. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> Shama Sundar Prabhu, you have now, a... the, other, the other question I made oh. is about okay. the protected cows and the difference if you have made any research. Oh. On that. Yes. If... Um, that, that's actually a, a, a separate subject from what we've been discussing 
uh, I'll just make a, a couple of quick observations. The first is, um, as we all know, uh, protected cows are extraordinarily rare. Out of the millions of cows on this planet today, you know, it's who knows, maybe one thousandth of one percent of the cow of those cows are protected. So, uh, practically speaking, uh, there are no scientists that are studying protected cows. So we don't have any research on this on that subject. Uh, important point, actually, I agree that it's it, it, it's something that should be looked at carefully. But there is no uh, scientific research that I'm aware of that I could quote uh, that addresses that point. Uh, you know, from a from a, a perspective of what I do understand. Uh, yeah, naturally, there's there's uh, going to be a difference if you have a, a, a psychology of the cow is such that they feel safe in their environment. Their 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 calves uh, they feel are are without are not in danger. They're going to have a, a entirely different mentality. I'll tell a brief story. Um, there, it's, it's known that cows who have a close relationship with their family, meaning their, the cow herd, their milkmaids, the, the farm that, you know, that know the people that take care of them. When those people are ill, the cows will, if they have access, if they have a rich pasture with many herbs out there, those cows will go <clears throat> and eat herbs that are beneficial for the condition. If, that, if one of their family members is ill, they'll go eat herbs that are good for that family member. And then actually those herbs will be passed into their milk and the family member will will take advantage of those herbs that way. I've I've I heard this I heard this a few times in India when I was researching cows, um, and and they they'll say that you know if the baby is the ba the baby is sick has a fever or something, then uh, they will they will tell this to the cow. <laughs> <laughs> and this is also an explanation um, for how um, Ayurvedic texts, how, how um, Vaidyas came to know that certain herbs are good for certain purposes. They would follow the cow and see what the cow eats <laughs> for this or that condition. <laughs> Yeah. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Uh, Shama Sundar. Hare Krishna, please excuse my muffled voice. I'm on my old computer. Oh, <laughs> okay. And um, you have flashing light. Looks like flashing lights also when you move forward and backward. Anyway. Um, my question is in continuation of Prabhudatta's exploration. During your presentation, you mentioned that there is more DHA produced from cows that have diverse pasture versus cows that are fed grains in the barn. But that percentage is very important because you didn't say that those in the barn are not producing DHA. But we're accepting that if you feed the cows better, they'll produce more. So from our position, kind of continuation of what Marge's point was earlier, we would like to know, well, how much DH hay the cows produce, even if they're eating grains in the barn comparatively. And particularly as the example that Prabhupada gave, which is also relevant to most of our gold sellers, that our cows usually are barn fed for six months a year, 
because of winter conditions, raising hay and raising forage. So what is the difference between a cow just eating hay and dried grasses in a barn compared to the DHA produced by cows that are eating um, you know, naturally diverse diets? So again, two, two examples you cited in your slides, but the, the numbers related to it are very important to, for our presentation. Is it that cows that are not fed, so is, it, is it that, you know, commercial farms don't get any DHA? Or is it that comparatively to those that are rearing their cows more naturally are producing significantly more? And do you have any figures to, you know, to put for that, that, that question? Yeah, okay. Um, <clears throat> it's comparatively more as to uh, figures, once again, uh, it was only in uh, uh, 2015, uh, this gentleman, Charles Benbrook, uh, wrote an article that began to look at this, this sort of issue in any uh, uh, rigorous way, a scientific way at all. Uh, and not many people have taken up the, the charge to do more research. Uh, so uh, there's not much to be able to answer your question. Uh, I can say this, that uh, as to uh, the uh, cow's winter season diet where they, they're not able to, to graze on pasture, uh, there is definitely going to be significantly less DHA in their diet. Then it's gonna depend on the nature of what it is they are being fed. In other words, is it only grains or is it uh, you know grains mixed with some uh, uh, preserved uh, you know pasture uh, grasses? And if so, how were those preserved? And so on. So uh, it becomes very technical very quickly, and. Uh, Again, I am not aware of research that's been done on this issue. I think the vast majority of the research that's been done on DHA and uh, 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 cow's diet, and more importantly, even uh, human diet, uh, has been done using um, either algae or uh, uh, fish oil or gr literally ground up fish as supplements to provide that enhanced diet or supposedly enhanced diet for the cows. Um, so to give you the numbers, which I appreciate your question and your, your perspective as, as I've known you has always been, you know, give me the numbers and that's, that's great. Uh, that's, the, that's the right way to go because ultimately, that's how we can we can figure this stuff out. Uh, however, sadly, there are there isn't much there that I I can give you. I can only say, as I said, comparatively, the cows with uh, uh, access to uh, really healthy pasture are the ones that are going to have more DHA than the cows that don't. I should also mention uh, this issue of, of taking too much milk. And yeah, you know, uh, Prabhupada was, he was a little bit here and there uh, about this, but you know, if you, if you kind of uh, boil it down, no pun intended, uh, you know, he talked about a cup or two uh, of milk per day uh, and some ghee and maybe, you know, some milk sweet. So uh, that was that was his, shall we say, prescription. Right. Yes, I've heard that. Um, I've heard that from before from other devotees who heard directly from Prabhupada. One one cup of milk a day, possibly two. Uh, I just heard that a few days ago. Okay, uh, Kalakanta. Uh, you need to unmute. Yeah. 
Oops, you're muted again. There. That's okay. Yeah. Yes. I also heard that from Paramananda Prabhu when we visited him personally. Uh, he mentioned that Prabhupada would mention that usually we take this cup of tea uh, or cup of milk. Um, but he also mentioned that the times Prabhupada would really appreciate just to have a big feast with paneer every now and then, but not like every day. Um, <clears throat> one thing which I, I, remind, I remembered was when visiting Ukraine, I don't know if it's specifically for the DHA, but definitely for the diet, they would grow on their roof. Their goshal was very interesting, this design. There's a glass at 45 degrees, and there's kind of a, an attic. And on that attic, they have trays, and they grow a lot of greens during the winter. And that is turned down, and it falls right with the dry. <laughs> so the cows have access to greeneries. Not only greeneries, but the barn is heated. So only with the heat of the cows, the whole barn is heated. Yeah. And it's very comfortable inside. So that was one interesting observation in that sense of offering fresh green photosynthesis material to their diets that I experienced in one cold country. Another point which I would like to bring out is uh, connected to your transition thought. Uh, when you mentioned regenerative, I like very much that you're connecting to regeneration of the soil, regeneration of the consciousness, and regeneration of our process, which means a, a route, right? That you're going from point A to point whatever, our point, final destination. So when I read Prabhupada, I hear him make a lot of uh, statements on the importance of that concern and going through a process of substitution over time. We produce the good milk. And now, as you said, you go from your farming system, which is now to the perfect farming system. So there's a few transitions. And I think that's very important because uh, when you lose that consumption, to go back to it may be very hard. I mean, <clears throat> after some time, you just get disused to that. And, and, and what I've observed is that if a product becomes obsolete for a culture, like for example, in Brazil, corn was a specific type of corn was very much used by the farmers. But that specific diet has kind of gone and with it has the corn gone for that diet because there's no more interest in that specific corn. And the same for cassava, the same for many other things. So in our culture, milk is so central. <clears throat> and we have this dilemma about the violence that we commit. So in your perspective, what would be a balanced approach? I mean, you kind of already explored, and I think your presentation points to numbers, which is a very good approach. But what would be a balanced approach to this? Uh I would say don't focus so much on um, red herrings like uh, should we be vegan or not or should we you know uh, in, uh, promote a certain type of diet or this that or the next thing uh, we should be looking more at um, how we can promote lifestyle that's supportive of a uh, healthy environment for our cows, for our uh, devotees, for uh, the uh, whole living environment on our farms, you know, not only the cows, but all the living entities on the farm from the, the microorganisms all the way to the, the trees and the birds and the fox and the every living entity. We need to be looking at how can we nicely take care of these, these, these uh, plants and animals so that they can thrive. And in that thriving environment, uh, we too can thrive and the very act 
of creating that environment is enhancing our own uh, uh, social connections, our own personal connections to to Krishna and our sadhana and our um, uh, relationship to Krishna consciousness. You know, it, it, it's it, it, it's not a, 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 a that taking care of cows and whatever whatever diet we may have is lives in a in a vacuum. It's that it all works together to create. Uh, a lifestyle, and you know, sometimes we use the 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 word varnashram here, <laughs> which of course brings in so many uh, thoughts. However, you know, it, if we can engage every uh, individual, no matter what their propensity. And how are we best going to do that? Prabhupada gave us Varnashram. He gave us this, you know, uh, image of Krishna living in a in a in a village environment where there's people working hard every day to to create this nice environment for the cows and for the the the, the plants and the trees and the you know everyone working together. And that's 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 what we need to focus on thank you for that it's so interesting just today we were in Gora village Krishna Kshetra Swami Vaikuntha Nita and I talking to about 50 Russian devotees oh. and the conclusion was so similar how strikingly similar <laughs> it just mm -hmm. at the very end pointed to lifestyle uh -huh. and, and it we stand, spend about from 12 to 6 p.m they couldn't go. We're just oh. talking. talking. <laughs> it's quite exciting. <laughs> yeah. Well, since, I... uh, just uh, since the since you invoked the word Varnashrama, I just wanted to mention that I was uh, I just heard an interview uh, with Ormila Devi, my god sister, done by uh, Chaitanya Charan. Prabhu on his monks podcast, and uh, this subject comes up uh, in a way which somehow I hadn't quite appreciated before. She's pointing out why does Prabhupada link Varnashram so much with farms, uh, and. She puts it in a very nice way, um, not in the beginning, you have to listen for some time, but she makes a lot of very interesting points also about, mainly of, she's talking about women and Varnashram, uh, but, you know, very sensible points she's making. Anyway, you may want to look for that. It's uh, the... Monk's podcast of Chaitanya Charan Prabhu. Yeah, I listened to it. Oh, you already? Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 For me, Very she brought together how Varna and Ashrama are related. When, mm -hmm. you, when you see it like that, there's Varna, there's Ashrama, and there's, uh, you know, simple living in the country it becomes possible to bring Varna and Ashrama together. Her point is that mm -hmm. since the Industrial Revolution, these have been split, and the women in particular have had to choose either Varna or Ashrama, and thus they've suffered. This is very interesting mm -hmm. analysis. Yeah. Um, I'm as, sort of watching... You know... Oh, go ahead. <laughs> Oh, I was just going to say, as you know, that I have a number of slides that that could be tacked on that uh, go into some detail about uh, this issue of the connection between uh, Prabhupada's interest in in uh, in milk and farming and with Varnashram in general. Uh, it's it's I, I consider it actually 
a crucial connection. I mean, that sure, as I said initially in this conversation, that uh, uh, understanding the, the scientific technicalities of DHA is nice, but it's only the beginning of an understanding of something that's much more profound. Mm. There is a very nice presentation made by His Grace Chaitanya Chandra Charan Prabhu in Russia, <clears throat> where his lecture was called <clears throat> Bhakti Starts with Pure Food. And he was <laughs> actually referring to this point that we are saying. Hmm. He was connecting Varna, Ashram, production of pure food, and the different nutrition levels. It's hmm. very much connected to what we have been discussed. It's also worthwhile listening. Um, we could. Um, what do you think, Kalakanta? Shall we invite Purushottam Shetra Prabhu for another session to show <laughs> more of his presentation, what he just mentioned? I think it's a great idea. And I think the second part, which he connects it to Vanashram, it's really quite interesting. And before I was researching the three modes in Varnashram, and now you're presenting nutrition in Varnashram. And so there's a big potential there. I think it's a great idea. Are you open to that, Prabhu? Absolutely, yeah. As I, I spoke as we were uh, uh, emailing back and forth, it, 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 this, uh, it's an important thing that should be connected. So yes. Good, so um, then the question is when? We've been meeting every couple of weeks, uh, which would mean the 27th of this month uh, for our next time. I don't know if because of Christmas season that's impractical for Everyone, um, I don't know. Oh, I'm open to suggestions. Yeah, uh, it's fine for me. Christmas is on 25th, so 27 right. is okay. <laughs> okay, by then everyone's recovered from any, any festivities, from uh, <laughs> drinking too much. Um, <laughs> Varuni. Too many milk sweets. <laughs> Too many milk sweets. <laughs> right. <laughs> she okay, well, then let's let's plan for that. And uh, we can again, I think, invite the wider uh, circle of devotees again. Um, so I think it's good time for us to end for today and i just want to say thank you for that um what you've shown us um it's it's giving it perspective it's it's pointing to you know what was always a mystery to me the finer tissues of the brain what is this about <laughs> We can yeah, that's, <laughs> that's exactly why I was scratching my head for so many years. But when I read that article, it's like, oh. yeah. <laughs> so that's well, nice. I just like to see a little piece of information that we have made a list of many leaders and topics which would like to continue our series. Uh, we started it, we have, we have interviewed yourself and we have interviewed many other devotees. And we want to transform that into a video. So we have like a resource, which then can be replicated. Besides publishing it straight in our social medias, whatever we, we do, we kind of make videos so that we have these resources available. So anybody who wants to further refer to that, it's just available in a nice organized way. So this could be used for that, if you all agree, and we would start sharing that. Very good. Sounds good. Sure. Okay, then. So any final words from our global minister? Well, I'm really happy with today's session. I think 
it's not only very valuable to look at this angle, but it's very much a broad presentation, which presents a big scenario for us to explore. And I can see how much enthusiasm uh, is generating and will generate as we promote this. And I think that's what Prabhupada really wanted. This very broad mind presentation, which can be presented any part of the globe to any person, and they'll, they'll start thinking about it. So mm -hmm. thank you, Prabhu. And thank you for the European uh, Sangha for organizing this. I'm very happy that this has happened tonight. And I hope we can do many more. Very good. And thank you all for joining us, all of you who have joined. And uh, have a nice next uh, week, two weeks, Christmas, whatever else is coming. <laughs> and um, Purushottam Kshetra Prabhu, please put in a prayer for us to Shishi Radha Damodar. Will do. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Thank you all. Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Ananta Krishna Vrinda ki jai. Gaur Prima Nande. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.